Good afternoon and welcome to Cats Chats. This is our third Cats Chats on history at St. Catharines and I'm delighted to be joined by two fellows from college. First of all, we have Professor Sir Chris Clark, who's the Regis Professor in History at the University of Cambridge and also the Ostra Professorial Fellow at St. Catharines. Chris is joined by Dr. Neve Gallagher, a University Lecturer at the University of Cambridge in modern British and Irish history. So, may I pass over to you, Neve, to start the conversation? Thank you. And thank you, Deborah. Thank you very much for attending this episode of Cats Chats. So, my name is Neve Gallagher, as Deborah kindly introduced me, and I've been a Fellow of the College since 2018. I've been Director of Studies for History for the last two years for History and the Joint Degrees, History and Politics and History and Modern Languages for Part 2, so for final year undergraduates. I'm also the Postgraduate Tutor for Finance and I help the postgraduate community within the College find financial resources that they need to continue with their studies. And in recent months, I've been helping many of our postgraduates who have been adversely affected by the pandemic. I also co-chair the METHR initiative with Lord Des Brown, a fellow commoner of the college, and together we've created this forum to promote shared understanding between the history of Britain and Ireland. With my other hat, I'm a lecturer at the Faculty of History in Modern Britain and in Modern Ireland, and I've recently written a book about the First World War, which is rather similar to my colleague Chris. Well, I'm Chris Clark. Um, I'm the Regis Professor of History and I'm a Fellow of St. Catharines. I have been um, for a very long time and I, well, <laughs> quite a long time, since the early 1990s. Um, and I wanted to say something about, a little bit about what I think is exciting and interesting about doing history at St. Catharines, what has been interesting over that period since 1991, when I, be, I was initially a, a junior research fellow and then I became a, a college teaching officer, which I was for quite some years. And then I got a faculty lectureship and eventually um, the professorship that I currently hold. And um, the college already had, when I arrived, a, a tradition of sorts, in a, a very strong living tradition in the, in the presence of its active fellows, but also a, a tradition in history that extended further back into its history. Um, there was John Neville Figgis, who was um, a fellow of the college, or studied at the college um, around the turn of the century, the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, he wrote a, an actually quite wonderful book called Christianity and History, which is a very likable attempt to explain why historians need to understand Christianity. He was himself an Anglican monk, um, so he was a man who took orders, but he, but he, he tried in this book to explain why, it, whether you were religious or not, you needed to understand the history of Christianity, the logic of, its, of, of Christian faith, in order to make sense of European and Western uh, history. And he did that in a very... Um, intelligent, eloquent and ecumenical way. So that was a sort of very likeable early historical voice in the college. There was Oliver McDonough who wrote a wonderful book about Victorian governance and how it changed in the mid-19th century. Um, and of course, when I arrived, there were two supremos in the college, my senior colleagues at the time, John Thompson and Chris Bailey. Chris Bailey was at that point um, really wide, still widely thought of as an Indianist, um, and of course, I was aware that he was a, a hugely respected figure in that field. Um, it was only a, a few years into my tenure at the college that uh, Chris began to branch out from Indian history into world history. And he did that by a series of steps, uh, having written really foundational texts, field shaping or discipline shaping texts about 18th and 19th century British India. He then um, went on to write a book called The Imperial Meridian, in which he talked about how the relationship between the great imperial complexes, in particular Britain and France, um, and the political struggles within those two complexes um, were connected. In other words, how the political life of empires affected the relationship between them. And that's where, for the first time, one could see Chris branching out into something that today we would call world history, though the term wasn't used very widely uh, at that time. Uh, a little bit later, Chris expanded on those those broader interests that he'd explored in, in the, the Imperial Meridian uh, in a book called um, the, the Birth of the Modern World, in which he really did, um, he didn't just establish himself as a world historian or a historian of the world, 
uh, or at least of the modern world. His book was really about the 19th century. He also co-established the field of world history. He sort of refounded it with this book um, because he set standards in terms of methodology and, and how to structure narrative, which um, remain in place today. And the, I, I, there are very few books in our discipline. Historians are fantastically squabblesome people who, who love to attack each other. But um, Chris's book commands a kind of consensual support, which is very, very rare ac across very wide areas. Uh, of the discipline. So I don't think I realized at first what a star Chris was, but I, it gradually did uh, dawn on me. And um, there, there came a point where I felt whenever I, uh, we went for drinks together, I always felt, well, wow, it's like having drinks with um, Elvis Presley. But um, in any case, that was Chris. Very sadly, Chris died a few years ago. He's still extremely sorely missed. We all worked very closely with him over years. He was a very active fellow of the college at many different levels, teaching. He was a tutor for many years uh, and so on. So that's really a terrible loss. But my other um, senior colleague, John Thompson, who then became a very close friend, we're still very good friends today. Um, he's a wonderful historian too. And uh, he wrote a, a, a marvelous book on the history of progressivism in 19th century America, uh, a, a lovely political biography of, of um, Woodrow Wilson. And um, for me, uh, though, the best book and my favorite one is his A Sense of Power, The Roots of America's Global Role. And I think the, I mean, it's a, a fabulous book in every way. It's extremely tightly argued from the first page right through to the, to the last. But unlike many history books, um, it, has, it, ha it has this rather special quality that it asks a question and then spends the entire book answering it. Uh, answering it. And the question is, why has America um, gone to all the expense and the risk that is involved in wielding its global, globally dominant role. Why has it done that? And the answers are not nearly as clear as one might, or obvious as one might think. And his book is an exceptionally interesting attempt to explore that question. And of course, in addition to uh, John, and at that time, Chris, there were other wonderful fellows in history, not all of them in the history faculty. One, Hans von der Fen, for example, a very distinguished historian of, of China, who'd written a wonderful book on uh, the Chinese way of war, Chinese warfare in the, in the 20th century, rather the whole political economy of warfare uh, in revolutionary China. And Nora Berendt, of course, an historian of Hungary initially, who wrote a wonderful book called The Gates of Christendom about Hungary's role or self-appointed role in protecting Christian Europe from various interlopers, Muslims most uh, importantly, um, and is now working on a, what I think is going to be a hugely important study of um, the history of nationalism, not just in Hungary, but in Europe more generally. But she uses Hungary as a case study in which she peels back the layers of nationalism, layers of nationalist myth, until it becomes clear eventually that we really know very little. The, most of the, 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 the myths of nationhood that sustain, for example, the current regime in, in Hungary are based on uh, suppositions, hearsay and, fa and, and pure fantasy. Um, so that's a very interesting exercise as well. So in all sorts of ways, um, St. Catherine's has been, you know, despite it, the modesty with which it presents itself, has been actually a real hub, an exciting intellectual hub uh, a wonderful place to think about history and to write about it. Neve, over to you. Yeah, thank you for that introduction of the history of history at the college. And even just to say a little bit more about the history today and what our students um, feel when they study the subject. There have been considerable changes over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, there are certainly more students in the college and in the faculty as a whole. So every year the faculty takes anywhere between 170 to 200 new undergraduates and CATS takes around 10 of those between history and then the joint degrees. The college is also very much committed to widening participation at the undergraduate level and at the postgraduate level. And of course, these concerns are very much the university's concerns as well. I think the research interests, Chris, you might agree with this, the research interests among us as historians and indeed among our student body have diversified a little bit as well. So the faculty is still very strong in its traditional fields of expertise, such as intellectual history or political history. But we do incorporate now more social and cultural history, which is very um, a, a sort of growing, growing fields have been in the last 30 and 40 years. And as you mentioned, we're widening our geographical reach, something that the college is still very much doing. Um, even at present, it's growing as East Asian research interest with the generous help of benefactors. But you, you started with talking a little bit about the 19th century. And even though we've had several changes since then, I think in some ways 
there are some similarities, one of which is our inability to combat um, pandemics, something which our, our 19th century compatriots were very much familiar with. So this has been a very unusual year for us, Chris, as, as teachers and as researchers. And I was wondering how has it affected your role as a researcher um, over the last few months? Well, what the pandemic has mainly meant for me is huge amounts of, of wonderfully um, travel-free time. I, I've, I've, I, I can't remember how many trips and uh, meetings and public, you know, whatever's this, that's, and the other things were cancelled. All of them involving trips. Some of them to quite, you know, quite remote locations. They were all cancelled within a couple of weeks. And what was astonishing was that, it was, that, that, that all that was a, just a tremendous relief. I, I didn't regret missing any of these um, occasions, and uh, which in turn suggested to me. And I'm sure I'm sure I'm not the only person who's had this thought that um, perhaps I hadn't been living my life in a very wise way. If it, if it were the case that I could, could, could forego most of the things that I do without regretting it, then that was a sign that perhaps I was doing the wrong things, um, namely travelling too much to places I didn't really need to be. And what that meant was I had plenty of time to sit and read and think and above all write. I'm working on a book at the moment. We can perhaps come to that later. Um, and also, But I also found that, that the pandemic made me think about history, partly because for me, it, it also seemed that the pandemic changed the experience of time. It was a very differently structured time. Uh, you know, we're used to time rushing, you know, and of course, there's always that, that whiz as deadlines rush by, which haven't been met. Um, that's a, a very big part of my life's experience. And, uh, and suddenly time wasn't rushing anymore. There was a sort of a time started pooling around the tasks that we that I had, and I found it much easier to attend to them more with the in, in the with the depth that they really demanded, and that included reading, writing, also conversation, spending time with um, my family. That was a, a sort of change in the in the quality of temporality, if you like, or the, the sort of texture of time. But I also found myself thinking about history. And one thing that struck me was something, Neve, that you've just mentioned, which is the, the weird um, sort of juxtaposition of old and new. On the one hand, you know, we know incomparably more about this um, virus than any of our predecessors in, in history knew about the diseases that uh, threatened them. So we can actually, you know, produce a micrograph of the virus. We can read its RNA and so on. But um, we still don't know how to, how to deal with it. We still don't know how to fight it. And that meant that in our techniques for, for dealing with the disease, we fell back on the time-tested uh, um, techniques of our of our of our ancestors. So that meant, you know, quarantine, lockdown, special social provisions for people who'd been kept away from work. They did exactly all this kind of thing, furlough and so on, during the um, visitations of the of the of the Black Death, for example, in the Italian cities of of um, Venice and Florence. They had very elaborate social provisions to deal with people who were no longer working, no longer had a regular income. There were special services to get people back into jobs who'd fallen out of them during the, the lockdowns and so on. So um, I started thinking about that. It was interesting to ponder on the problem of fear, people's fear of, of disease, which is a, a, a red thread that runs right through the history of um, pandemics in human, in, in human experience. And I recalled the case in uh, Florence of the, of the Sanità, the public health authority, who were very concerned about fear because they thought that extreme fear of disease actually increased your susceptibility to it. So they tried in their public uh, announcements and so on to keep everybody as calm as possible. Um, but at the same time as trying to, um, to reduce fear, of course, there was a danger of people not being afraid enough. And so we have the case of some officials of the Sanitar who w walked past a house one night while carrying out an inspection in which some naughty young Florentines were having a sort of wild dance um, in which they weren't observing you know, social distancing or anything like it. And so they went down to a nearby graveyard um, picked up the corpse of a recently dead woman and dragged it up to the, the place where the party was taking place, threw this corpse into the centre of the room among the dancers and said, she wants to dance too. So um, by that means they hope to put the fear of, well, if not of God, then at least of the Black Death into the, into the dancers. So there are, you know, I, was, I found myself thinking, and I know I'm not the only one, all the time about parallels and differences um, between our present and our past. It may be the case that that the economic shock produced by this COVID um, threat, the COVID-19 threat, is in some ways unprecedented. But on the other hand, um, you know, the, the encounter with, with pandemic disease is anything but new. I mean, it's the, one of the oldest stories that humans have. I mean, it, these diseases have been with us since the very beginning. And so 
Um, it's that sort of perplexing combination of a very old story with very new dimensions uh, that got me thinking about the, the sort of historicness of the experience that we were going through. Yes, well, I think from from the college end, um, it's been slightly different. Uh, a lot more firefighting, I think, would be a more apt description of what's happened over the last few months. So in my role as postgraduate tutor, we've had to deal with um, our, our undergraduate and postgraduate body leaving the college very, very quickly, effect- effectively evacuating. And we were there to support them to do that. Um, and we encountered so many tricky problems I couldn't even have foreseen at the beginning of March. Uh, borders closing, flights cancelling um, or being cancelled, airlines going bust, um, the, the prices of flights escalating, students needing access to capital, quite a lot of capital quite quickly so that they could quarantine in whatever country they were returning to. All of this was very difficult and obviously wasn't part and parcel of the role in, in previous previous months or, or years. So that was a, a real learning ex- experience for me and for all of the other tutors. And I think in terms of teaching as well, it's been really different because many of our second years who ordinarily would be doing their research, their dissertation research over the summertime, were unable to go to archives. And this is quite different for a historian who relies on archives to produce their research. So they needed a lot more handholding in order to ensure that their projects could be done feasibly using digital resources. And in some ways, that's been a really wonderful development um, during this pandemic, and it's really put it into light for previous years. The volume of material that's available online is simply fantastic, particularly for the 19th century and the 20th century. So that's that's been really um, a, a really good development, development in some ways. But speaking of, of research, I think we'll move now on to talking a bit more about our own mutual interest in the First World War. So, Chris, obviously your book, The Sleepwalkers, written about the July crisis of 1914, um, shot to international fame only a handful of years ago. And I thought we could just talk a little bit about that. And you might be able to tell me what interested you in the July crisis of 1914. And and what were you saying that was new? Because it's not like this is a a topic that's never been touched before. No, it's certainly not a topic that has ever been (laughs) touched before. That was one of the most horrible things about it is that the debate over the First World War is, is as old as the war itself. I mean, it, it's it actually, in some ways, it started before the war did, because already uh, in the documents produced by the people who brought this war into the world, we find arguments and counter-arguments. You know, you're, you're the one who's about to cause a war. No, you are. No, it's you. No, it's you. So, um, you know, and, and it's astonishing how many of the arguments that are later developed in the secondary literature, we, we find in, in a sort of, you know, uh, unredacted form on the lips of the decision makers who um, who actually brought this war about. How did, how how could one make this story fresh? That was such an old story uh, with such an oceanic sort of elaboration of of historiography. And what I decided to do was to just to not not to change the answer because I didn't actually know what the answer was. I mean, theoretically, historians shouldn't know what the answers to their questions are until they've actually done some research. But I thought I might try ans- uh, d- changing the question, and instead of asking. Why did the war happen? Which is which usually means um, who did it? You know who done it? Who's the villain? Um, rather than asking that question, I would ask the question: How did it come about? Because the how question involves <clears throat> looking at all the different mechanisms which have to be in place to make a war like this come about, and then and only then afterwards uh, asking you know who put which mechanisms in place? Who's responsible for this? you know, unhappy concatenation of causes. And um, whereas the, the, the why question involves saying, well, who's the villain? And once you've decided on a villain or you've, you've, you've got a suspect, you, you, you collect evidence against the suspect, a bit the way the police um, approach, you know, a, a forensic situation. So I decided to do that via the how rather than the why question and to try and refresh, refresh the, the issues in that way. Um, but of course, you know, one can't please everybody, and I certainly didn't please everybody. What about you? I mean, it is a stra- an odd thing, isn't it? We've both spent a lot of time thinking about this conflict. It's been quite important in your intellectual development as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, you mentioned the word um, controversies. I, mean, I certainly have encountered that in my own research. So my book, which is about Ireland and the First World War, um, well, the First World War is not really part and parcel of how we think about modern Ireland. From the years 1912 through to 1923, 
a series of political events happened, which are typically called the Irish Revolution. And these events are essentially what was behind the breakup of the 1801 Union. So when all of Ireland was a part of the United Kingdom and the creation of two new states on the island of Ireland, the state of Northern Ireland and what's now become the Republic. So there are the events that have typically been at the forefront of historians writing about Ireland in these years. The First World War doesn't really fit into that. Irish men served in the British Army. And how do we tally that with this narrative of Irish separation from the United Kingdom? Um, so I really wanted to actually do something very similar, Chris. Instead of looking to the end of the story, which was independence and partition and the creation of two states, it was to see how people responded to the war at the time, what their attitudes were and what their behaviour was to the conflict as it evolved both within Ireland, but in many Irish diasporic communities throughout the, Brit the former British Empire and in America as well. So that's really what I wanted to do, um, to really put a big bit of contingency and agency, I think you once mentioned those words, back into the history of Ireland at that time. And certainly it was um, not, the, not the, the, the easiest thing to write. I, I encountered a lot of difficulty with various colleagues at the time trying to put forward this new way of looking at that period. And Chris, I think you encountered a bit of controversy as well. Would you be able to say a bit more about that? Well, I, I experienced a lot of, um, you know, controversy. I mean, um, the book takes the Balkan dimension of the outbreak of this war seriously, which means that I looked very closely at um, what was happening in Serbia before 1914. And um, to put it mildly, I, I wasn't the most popular man in Belgrade after the book appeared. Um, on the other hand, in Croat, the Croats uh, loved the book. I mean, I was I, they loved me in Zagreb, and there was some controversy in Germany too. The Germans didn't. The Germans didn't. You know, the Germans wanted to hold on to their sort of lion's share of the guilt. They wanted to be the only ones who'd caused this war. My my book was arguing for a more distributed um, account of the causation, but I also wanted to bring out the kind of multiplicity of forces caught up in this very complex conflict. Because for me, the key word was complexity. It did seem to me that this, the the etiology, the causation of this war was sort of hyper complex in a way that's not the case for the Second World War, the Crimean War, and other great confl conflicts, which are compl you know, complicated enough, but don't have this dimension of hyper complexity. But your, your, your book on Ireland is interesting, because in, in, this, in talking about the First World War as a sort of experience for the Irish, um, for the people of Ireland, you stress the togetherness of the of the confessional communities. You talk about experiences and also behaviours. And what interests me is, you know, you, so you put Catholics and Protestants together, and you have photographs in the book, which where where you you have you know uh, joint ceremonies and so on, where Catholics and Protestants are standing in huge crowds, remembering the same Irish fallen. So. Um, that doesn't sit very comfortably with a, with a, an approach to the, the history of Ireland, which is about division and conflict. No, no, it certainly doesn't. Um, I mean, as I said, the division and conflict has been really a part and parcel of how Irish history has been has been done by historians. Uh, and, and very few historians have tried to think about uh, looking at looking across those divisions. So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and as you say, I find this was a very much um, a, a huge sense of solidarity was created between both groups during the war um, as a result of what the Allies were fighting for. Something we find very difficult to conceptualise today. I mean, the First World War still doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. As you say, Chris, it's incredibly complex compared with the Second World War. Very briefly, Chris, you're working on the 1848 revolutions. Can you just tell us a little bit about what, what you're working on and why they're significant? I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the 1848 revolutions because it seems to me that they are uh, when I first learned about them at school, I hated them because I thought they're terribly complicated and they seem to be a failure. Well, um, on closer analysis, it turns out they are indeed terribly complicated, but they're not a failure. They do produce very deep changes and in many ways they kind of re-anchor the history of modern Europe. They're the, the, the point, a point of origin for a lot of key things, key features of not modern European history. So that's what I'm trying to tease out, basically, the, 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 this moment of revolution. Really interesting project, Chris. Um, so we've we've had loads of questions from all of our attendees, which is simply fabulous, but we can't get through them all. So um, I've chosen a couple at random. And uh, the first question, Chris, I'm going to ask you is about Bismarck. I think you know something about him. And you're quite, the question is, did Bismarck craft a premeditated plan towards the unification of Germany, or was he a serial opportunist given the events that unfolded after 1850? Serial opportunist is actually a fantastic way of summing up Bismarck. Um, 
Bismarck never had a preconceived plan for anything. He had, uh, Bismarck always believed in multiple targets in breadth and in depth, by which I mean, you know, always have more than one target in view. Um, you, you know, you could do, you could focus on trying to unify the country or, or bring Germany more deeply under the influence of Prussia, or you could focus on railways, or you could focus on some, you know, ticklish customs issues. You've got all these different things which you can think about. And if one thing, you get blockage in one area, you simply move to another. So that's multiple targets in, in breadth. But he also believed in multiple targets in depth. So, for example, German unification. Well, uh, I think he was thinking in the late, uh, you know, in the run up to the war with France, he was thinking, well, maybe there'll be a war with France if the Fr- French are dumb enough to declare war on Prussia, then there could be a war. Maybe there won't be. Um, there'll just be a war scare. That would be great anyway, because then we could use that to sort of make arguments to Bavaria and, and Württemberg and Baden about how they should come closer to us in a security union. And so on. So he's always thinking about the different ways and the different um paces at which you can achieve longer term aims. You could do it in five years, 10 years, with a conflict, without conflict, uh, and so on. So it's always multiple. It's, it's highly, highly opportunistic. But I was also sent some questions, and um, I wanted to cho- select one for you. And that was, the question was, in what way do you think um, historical memory shapes the behavior of historical actors, politicians, and so on? Really, really interesting question. Um, I mean, it does tremendously and it has done throughout history. So even if I were to think about Ireland in, in the period I've been looking at, the nationalist agitation for a measure of self-government from Westminster very much relied on thinking about particular episodes in history, the Cromwellian invasions, uh, British misgovernment and during the Great Irish Famine of the 1840s. These episodes were very much at the forefront of, of nationalist efforts to dissociate Ireland from, from Britain. Um, and indeed, they've become part and parcel of the selective memory of a variety of Republicans ever since who have these key episodes in history that they always turn to to, to justify why they're doing what they've been doing. To take a more British example, I'm also working on uh, a project on Churchill in Ireland at present. And Churchill, I don't know if anyone has read any of his epic volumes, it's the Second World War volumes I'm thinking of in this case. And he, in those he references Napoleon quite a lot. And he clearly was a, a big admirer of Napoleon, both as a strategist um, and a general. And I think he saw himself in that vein. And then he very uniquely got the, ep- the opportunity to craft his own narrative about how he was very similar through these volumes ask how we remember him. So I think we, we've drawn to a close, which is amazing. Um, I want to say thank you very much to everybody for attending. The next Cats Chats will be on Friday, the 30th of October 2020 uh, with Des Brown, William Sutherland and David Aldridge. Um, it'll be at the same time and it'll be on the subject of biosecurity research at St. Catharines. So I want to say thank you very much for me for attending. And I'd like to thank the alumni office for putting together this, this series of chats. And I'd like to um, thank you all for turning up. It's fantastic that you've joined us. And thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the series.